Winter, 1779. The American War for Independence was at a crisis point. Although outnumbered and outgunned by Great Britain's immensely powerful military, the upstart American army held on and won unexpected surprising victories on northern battlefields such as Trenton, Princeton, and Saratoga. But the war in the North wound its bloody way to a standoff. After five years of bloody fighting, the Revolutionary War ground to a face-off with no winner in sight. The British High Command had a plan, a Southern strategy. A powerful British army would invade South Carolina, conquer and occupy it quickly, then invade North Carolina and do the same, and on into Virginia. Like clockwork in December of 1779, Charleston was surrounded and besieged. Day after day, week after week, month after month, the British Army tightened its grip on the city. Finally, in May of 1780, the city's continental defenders could hold on no longer. Charleston, with its critically important seaport, an entire American army, and an irreplaceable store of American artillery and equipment, surrendered to the British. Once in control, British forces ruled South Carolina with an iron fist. Their commander, General Charles Cornwallis, Lord Cornwallis, was an experienced, capable British Army commander who was a member of the English gentry, but who was willing to use harsh tactics to destroy the American rebellion. He issued this order to his commanders. All the inhabitants of this province who have submitted to or taken part in this revolt shall be punished with the greatest rigor. They should be imprisoned and their whole property taken from them and destroyed. Private homes were burned to the ground. In numerous places, churches were set ablaze to terrorize and intimidate anyone who opposed the British occupation. Men who resisted were hanged. And in some places, so were young men and boys who simply tried to avoid serving with the British Army. Near the border of North and South Carolina, not far from the modern community of Waxhaws, a memorial today marks the location of an infamous British atrocity. Here in 1780, after the fall of Charleston, British cavalry rode down a force of several hundred Patriot troops from Virginia who had come south to help oppose the British invasion. Most of the Virginians dropped their weapons and tried to surrender, but they were cut down by British sabers. The slaughter became known as the Wax Hawes Massacre, and throughout the southern backcountry, American patriots were enraged by the news 
and embittered by the attitude of the British conquerors. By the autumn of 1780, South Carolina appeared to be firmly under British control, and it was time for the second phase of the British Southern strategy, the invasion of North Carolina. Leaving troops to defend Charleston and his outposts in South Carolina, General Cornwallis marched his British army through the South Carolina countryside and encamped just south of the state line near the hamlet of Charlotte. There, Cornwallis would wait for the arrival of the British force that would compose the left flank of his army. In command of the British Army's left flank was 36-year-old Major Patrick Ferguson. Unlike most British officers, however, he was a Scot, but not from the mountainous highlands of Scotland, so dear to so many Scottish immigrants to America. Ferguson was a city boy, from the populous, bustling city of Edinburgh, where his father was a lawyer, a judge, and a lord. There, under the looming shadow of Edinburgh Castle, young Patrick Ferguson grew up as a member of the British gentry, dreaming of military glory and a high rank in the British Army like others in his family before him. After a stint at a military college, he found himself in combat, serving in the British cavalry against the French in the Seven Years' War while still in his teens. Like other young men of the gentry, Ferguson made a quick jump in rank by buying a captain's commission in the British Army. Posted to the Caribbean and Canada, he became ill, was confined to barracks, and there ingeniously developed a prototype for a breech-loading flintlock rifle. In 1777, Ferguson was sent to America in command of a 100-man rifle corps using his breech loaders. Ferguson showed courage in combat, but he was badly wounded at the Battle of Brandywine, and it appeared that he might be heading home to England with his military career at an end. By the time the British captured Charleston, Patrick Ferguson had surprised the army surgeons, recovered from his womb, and returned to command, in time to join the invading British army in occupying South Carolina. He brought with him a new nickname, the Bulldog, which reflected his newfound reputation for ferocity in battle. Back in New Jersey, he had led a legion of loyalist light infantry in a surprise nighttime bayonet attack on sleeping Continental troops, killing 50 before they could get to their weapons. A hundred well-trained British troops charging at you with bayonets, that's a frightening thing. That anticipation of having that bayonet thrust into you and then turned as the British would do, causing that severe trauma to wherever it would hit and being very difficult for surgeons to be able to, to, to patch you up. Posted to Charleston in 1780, the handsome young British officer became something of a sensation within the city's loyalist community, earning the reputation of a charming ladies' man with Charleston's pro-British gentry. But charm was not what Ferguson would display when South Carolina's British commander, General Cornwallis, gave him a new command. Ferguson was to organize a large corps of provincial troops, loyalist soldiers, which would be the left flank of Cornwallis's army when the British invaded North Carolina. In September of 1780, as General Cornwallis prepared to invade North Carolina, Ferguson's 1,000-man corps of well-drilled loyalists was ready and advanced through the South Carolina Piedmont on a parallel march to Cornwallis's army. 
His troops passed farms and through settlements, recruiting Loyalist volunteers where they could. But most South Carolinians on their route resisted and paid a high price, losing their homes and barns, which Ferguson set ablaze. When the army's occupying an area, if you terrorize them and they rise up against you, it puts a lot of soldiers at risk. And that would completely, um, every army has a mission and that would completely harm the mission and hurt the objectives. As he marched his corps of house burners through the South Carolina backcountry, Ferguson learned of a scattering of settlements far to the west in the Blue Ridge Mountains of the Western Carolinas and East Tennessee. The people in the mountain settlements were Scotch-Irish, no lovers of England or its king, but they lived in isolated, hard-scrabble communities in the mountain hollows and highlands and were more focused on surviving on the frontier than fighting a war. Even so, Ferguson believed they should be loyal to king and country, and their men and boys should join his Loyalist Army Corps. So he marched his troops into the mountains as a show of force and turned loose a prisoner with a warning to the mountain people. If they refused to support his loyalist forces, he would, quote, march my army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay your country to waste with fire and sword. Ferguson's warning of destruction by fire and sword was carried through the hills and hollows of the Blue Ridge country, but he had seriously misjudged the people he had threatened, the Scotch-Irish people in the mountainous Appalachian frontier. America's Scotch-Irish people had come to the Blue Ridge Mountains and the rest of the Appalachian mountain chain in search of freedom, independence, isolation, and country that resembled their beloved Scottish Highlands. Some of them, or their parents or grandparents, had come to America directly from Scotland, where the Scottish clans had battled the English monarchy for generations, going back to the days of the Scottish leaders William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. Today in modern London, largely unknown and unnoticed, a park and monument in old London Smithfield neighborhood marks the spot where in 1305, Scottish hero William Wallace was executed, drawn and quartered for waging war against England on behalf of Scottish independence. It was a historical event that molded the attitude of America's Scotch-Irish toward the British monarchy at the time of the American Revolution. The name Scots-Irish came from the many poor Scots who immigrated to America from Northern Ireland, where they had been relocated in the 1600s by King James I in an attempt to placate the Scottish clans while controlling the rebellious Irish. Whether they had immigrated to America directly from Scotland or from Northern Ireland, they collectively became known as the Scots-Irish. In the 60 years leading to the American Revolution, more than a quarter million of them had come to America. Unlike other immigrants, they did not settle in a single region. They were scattered throughout the 13 colonies. But from New England to Georgia, they populated the Appalachian Mountains, where the terrain and climate reminded them of their ancestral home in Scotland. There, they became experts in frontier survival. It was said by an English observer who knew the Scots-Irish well that they were not the sort of folk with whom it was safe to trifle. In their isolated Appalachian strongholds, the Scots-Irish were clannishly devoted to family, friends, and freedom. And when Major Patrick Ferguson threatened to lay waste to their homes and families with fire and sword, they believed him 
and to stop him, they vowed, they would go find him, defeat his army, and shoot him dead. From throughout the mountain country of East Tennessee, Scots-Irish mountaineers who got the word about Major Ferguson and his corps of loyalists headed through the Blue Ridge Mountains to an assembly point. They rendezvoused in late September of 1780 alongside the Watauga River at a mountain clearing in East Tennessee called Sycamore Shoals. There they were joined by more mountaineers from southwestern Virginia. Mixed among the Scots-Irish were other Patriot Americans, German, Irish, English, Huguenots, men of different ancestries, but men cut of the same independent-minded cloth. There, alongside the Watauga, they got themselves organized, and maybe there they picked up a name that would ring through history. If this British officer Ferguson called himself the Bulldog, they too would have a nickname. They had come over the mountains, and they would call themselves the Over Mountain Men. They had gained their grit in the wilderness, where they had faced bears, wolves, and mountain lions. Many of them had learned the ways of war and the ruthless Indian fighting in the frontier. So they were accustomed to fighting frontier style with knives, tomahawks, and long-range hunting rifles. Another weapon they brought with them was rock-hard Scots-Irish courage, what mountain folks called gumption. They're trying to protect their loved ones. Uh, every time you know, you're on your home territory, something that's native to you, that's in jeopardy, that's that's going to be more dear to you and honestly it can kind of create a, a, sen a sense of shock that if, if they can't get the job done at the end of the day they're going to jeopardize their loved ones and, and the futures of those around them. There at Sycamore Shoals they double checked their powder and weapons, sharpened their knives and tomahawks and prepared for what lay ahead. They also heard a sermon. Many of them were Scots-Irish Presbyterians who were generally law-abiding and obedient to man-made authority unless they believed that man-made authority was attempting to put itself above what they believed to be the higher law of the Bible. In some ways, some said, the Scots-Irish Presbyterians resembled Oliver Cromwell's soldiers who had battled the royal armies in the English Civil War a century earlier. And it was also said of the Overmountain men that their favorite part of the Bible was the Old Testament with its faithful and heroic figures like Joshua, Josiah, and Caleb. A pioneer Presbyterian pastor named Samuel Doak was with the Overmountain men at Sycamore Shoals, and there he inspired them with the familiar story of the Old Testament warrior Gideon, who defeated a giant army of enemies with a much smaller force of faithful, hand-picked warriors.
On September 26, 1780, the column of Overmountain men left Sycamore Shoals and headed southeastward, beginning a long trek through the Blue Ridge Mountains that would take them in search of Major Ferguson and his Loyalist troops. Most were on horseback and they drove a herd of cattle with them for meat on the journey. They crossed into western North Carolina and camped for the night alongside the Tow River at a site called Shelving Rock, where they butchered their beef, feasted on steaks, and rested for the confrontation that lay ahead. It was there, deep in the high country of western North Carolina, with campfires shooting sparks into the night, that they set their minds on what they had to do and they picked an overall commander to lead them in the fight ahead. His name was William Campbell, a tall, tough, frontier fighter from the back country of Virginia. He was a brother-in-law of Patriot leader Patrick Henry, who had once vowed, give me liberty or give me death. Campbell had showed up at Sycamore Shoals leading a passel of fighters from the Virginia back country and wearing his Scottish ancestor's broadsword. The over-mountain men and their leaders agreed. Campbell was the man to lead them on their search for Major Patrick Ferguson. Good leadership is going to install discipline, it's going to provide a direction, a motivation, um, and it's going to influence the soldiers underneath them to do the right thing, to stay disciplined during his operations. Um, a good leadership will stand out. Right, He's going to basically lead by example and the troops are going to follow him. You know, if you have a bad leader, you're not going to have the same discipline that you are going to have as a good leader. They continued their march through the mountains, crossing the crest of the Appalachians at towering Roan Mountain, a 6,000-foot-high peak near the North Carolina border. They found the mountain already covered in snow at its pinnacle, shoe-top deep in snow, they reported. But to the over-mountain men, the high elevation and rugged terrain were just the familiar type of surroundings they knew back home. To get over the backbone of the Appalachians, they followed an ancient Indian trail, which took them through a pass under Yellow Mountain, a 5,000-foot high peak, and led them into North Carolina. Their route was largely downhill now, but the country was rugged and the trails were narrow, and they feared that Ferguson might learn of their approach and flee. So they separated into several groups to move more quickly and continued heading to the south. Unknown to the over-mountain men during their trek over the mountains, they had a spy in their ranks who had slipped away and ridden ahead to warn Ferguson. So warned, Ferguson put his troops on the march and headed east to catch up with General Cornwallis and the main British Army. Arriving at Ferguson's empty campsite, the over-mountain men were disappointed, but no less determined, and they pushed on towards South Carolina. On September 25, 1780, General Cornwallis's 2,000-man British Army entered North Carolina to begin the British campaign to conquer and occupy the state as it had done to South Carolina. In the crossroads village of Charlotte, Cornwallis's troops fought a fierce skirmish with Patriot militia, who were finally defeated and driven away. Cornwallis then encamped his army in Charlotte, where he set up his headquarters and his troops rested and waited for Major Ferguson to bring up the Army's left flank. Instead, on October 6th, Ferguson brought his troops here, to a 60-foot-high, rugged, forested hill that was strewn with boulders. It was located about 36 miles west of Charlotte, an easy two-day march for Ferguson's troops. But for reasons unknown to history, Ferguson stopped short of joining Cornwallis' powerful army and ordered his troops to set up camp on the summit of the wooded hill. Locally, it was called 
King's Mountain, and Ferguson proclaimed it to be the perfect site to defeat the ragtag mountaineers who were following him. No battle line of enemy troops could advance up the rugged, rocky, tree-covered slope of King's Mountain without being destroyed by fire from above, Ferguson believed. He would be the king of that mountain, he reportedly proclaimed, stating that God himself could not drive him off that powerful position. Well, arrogance can lead to not implementing the training uh, to its fullest effect. Arrogance can lead to having a favorable position and turning it into a uh, position where you get somebody hurt, get somebody killed in a combat operation. Today, the site where Major Ferguson chose to make his stand is preserved by the U.S. National Park Service as Kings Mountain National Military Park. It is commemorated by a towering stone monument, a national park museum, and the preservation of terrain much as it existed in 1780. Like many of his fellow British officers, Ferguson viewed the American soldiers who opposed him with disdain, stating once that a volley of gunfire in the cold steel of a bayonet would be all that would be necessary to scatter such rebels. That's poor leadership. It will result in defeat. It will result in people getting hurt, people dying, and that's, that's a failure. With that attitude of disdain, Ferguson felt it unnecessary to build defensive works on the military crest of Kings Mountain. Without a good leadership, um, your men or women could be lost. Um, you're there to be able to lead your people, tell them what to do, how to do it, and then they're supposed to execute. So without that um, order or command, then it would be chaos. Meanwhile, the over-mountain man had crossed into South Carolina and had reached a well-known backcountry meadowland known locally as the Cowpens. There, Gideon-like, Colonel Campbell, their overall commander, selected about 900 of the fittest men, mounted them on the freshest horses, and moved quickly to catch up and do battle with Ferguson and his loyalist troops. They set out down the country road from Cowpens to Kings Mountain, a distance of about 30 miles, and marched all night. The following day, October 7, 1780, they came in sight of Kings Mountain. Immediately, they moved into position to attack. Colonel Campbell organized his makeshift army into two main divisions and ordered an assault on the rugged hill from all sides. Within moments, they encountered a line of Ferguson's troops who opened fire and dropped several of the over-mountain men, but the rest surged forward like a flood. At the sound of the opening fire, the over-mountain men let loose what sounded like a Scottish battle cry from ages past. It rang through the woods and echoed atop King's Mountain. Major Ferguson, sent his British troops racing to their battle line and unleashed a searing fire down the hillside. It did nothing, however, to stop the over-mountain men. Dismounted and on foot, they determinedly began to climb the hill and attack the British position, fighting not shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder British style, but instead advancing from tree to tree and boulder to boulder firing as they moved forward. Mounted on a handsome white stallion, Major Ferguson rode back and forth across the wooded hill, directing the British defense as the over-mountain men pressed his troops. The Battle of King's Mountain was fully underway. Today, the epic battle is commemorated in South Carolina's capital, in the ornate main lobby of the South Carolina State House. There, an extraordinary artwork by acclaimed South Carolina artist Robert Wilson depicts the Battle of King's Mountain in riveting detail.
As the over-mountain men fought their way up the sides of King's Mountain, Ferguson's increasingly desperate soldiers boldly used the bayonet to drive them back. Despite the fierce British bayonet charges, the over-mountain men would regroup, then fight their way back up the hill. As the mountaineers moved upward, firing from cover, the British soldiers began dropping. Ferguson's British troops were armed with the standard issue British-made flintlock musket, the Brown Bess, a highly respected weapon, but with a disadvantage at King's Mountain. Most of the over-mountain men were armed with long-barreled hunting rifles, called Southern Mountain Rifles by some. And at King's Mountain, their weapons were more than a match for the British firearms. The battle became desperate, chaotic, with the gunfire rising to a steady roar and the whitish smoke of the firearms cloaking the woods like fog. In the words of a survivor, the mountain was covered in flame and smoke and seemed to thunder. And Ferguson's men were now falling fast, one after another. The over-mountain men pressed forward, stalled at one point by a group of Ferguson's troops who had broken ranks and taken up position behind a cluster of boulders, but they were finally overrun, killed, or driven back. At another point in the battle, two Loyalist soldiers were firing from behind a large hollow chestnut tree. One of the Patriot militiamen from North Carolina took careful aim and silenced both men, only to discover later that they were his brothers. After about 45 minutes of heavy fighting, the over-mountain men had inflicted severe casualties on Ferguson's troops. The survivors were steadily pushed back across the summit onto the portion of the hill where they had set up camp. There, still clustered in open woods, they fell in droves. Amid the smoke and flame and noise on King's Mountain, Major Ferguson rode back and forth on his white stallion directing his troops. Several times his men tried to raise white flags, but Ferguson ordered them away, shouting, some said, that he would not surrender to rebel bandits. The troops will lose confidence in their commander really quickly um, if they see that their commander doesn't necessarily care about their well-being um, and doesn't really truly invest himself into protecting his soldiers, not only himself, but the, his subordinates. You know, they'll lose confidence in their commander, maybe not fight the way they should for their commander. Finally, near the wooded hill's rocky crest, Ferguson was cornered. He boldly tried to ride through the Patriot ranks to escape, but several of the over-mountain men realized his identity and fired simultaneously. Ferguson fell from his horse, mortally wounded, but his boot caught in the stirrup and dragged him over the rocky ground until he came loose. Lying on the ground, barely alive, he still had the fire of fight in him. He pulled out a flintlock pistol and shot the nearest over-mountain man dead. A half dozen others then immediately emptied their rifles into Ferguson's body, and the British bulldog was dead. Meanwhile, Ferguson's surviving troops were surrounded with no way of escape. Ferguson's second-in-command, Captain Abraham de Paster, raised a white flag. Some of the over-mountain men yelled for vengeance for the Waxhall Massacre and wanted to keep fighting, but their commanders ordered a ceasefire, and King's Mountain suddenly fell silent. The battle had lasted barely one hour. The over-mountain men counted 28 killed and 62 wounded in their ranks. The British dead numbered approximately 290, with 163 wounded, and more than 600 captured. Major Patrick Ferguson was buried near where he fell, beneath a pile of rocks in a grave site that has been preserved on King's Mountain 
to this day. When the Overmountain men realized the battle was over and that the British officer who had threatened their families, farms, and freedom was no longer a threat, the scarred and smoky hilltop echoed with their cheers. Their duty done, the Over Mountain men reversed their route and headed back to their high country hills and hollows, and the other Patriot troops went their own way. One of the Patriot officers, Militia Colonel Benjamin Cleveland of North Carolina, took with him a trophy of war from the battlefield, Major Ferguson's handsome white stallion, which Cleveland triumphantly rode back to his mountain home. The Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia received the news of the Patriot victory at Kings Mountain one month after the battle. It was carried there in person by one of the Over Mountain men, 20-year-old Joseph Greer of Tennessee, who walked more than 600 miles to deliver it. Soon the victory was proclaimed by newspapers throughout the new nation, and the news proved to be a major boost to American morale at a critical time in the War for Independence. It also boosted morale in South Carolina, where partisan bands of guerrilla fighters led by Francis Marion and others ceaselessly harassed the remaining British forces. News of the battle quickly reached General Cornwallis in Charlotte, but to Cornwallis, it was a shocking catastrophe. The entire left flank of his army had been destroyed, and soon, the British Southern strategy began to unravel. Cornwallis tried to go forward with his invasion of North Carolina, but after Kings Mountain, his troops were no longer seen as invincible and were battered and exhausted from repeated fighting with an army commanded by General Nathaniel Greene that had been sent south by General Washington. Unable to conquer the Carolinas as intended, Cornwallis moved his army into Virginia anyway and was surprised and trapped by a joint American and French army commanded by General Washington at the village of Yorktown. There, surrounded, besieged, and defeated, Cornwallis surrendered his worn and weary army on October 19, 1781, ending the Revolutionary War in an astounding American victory, a triumph that in no small way was spurred by the fierce struggle on that rocky wooded hill in South Carolina. The victory won there by the Over Mountain men and their compatriots proved to be so critically important that founding Father Thomas Jefferson called it the turn of the tide. It was a turn that led to the birth of a nation, the United States of America, which was, in a mighty measure, inspired by the American gumption, grit, and glory at the Battle of Kings Mountain. Kiss my boy, John. 